Okay, so what this is saying is you have all these things in place because sin is rampant. And if sin was rampant then, it's certainly much more so now. What we're talking about is looking at this issue, the, the issue of marriage between one man and one woman, and, and, and trying to find the scriptural guideline that we must follow. If we don't take the moral guidelines of the scriptures and hold them up as a standard, and, and again, and I want to stress, as we stressed earlier in the program, of the scriptures in their entirety, because if you want to focus on just the law, you have a lot of penalties. A man picked up sticks on the Sabbath and was stoned to death in the, in the Old Testament because he violated the Sabbath. Do we believe that now? No. Jesus explained what the Sabbath was to us. He gave us an ample understanding of it, and he also gave us an ample understanding of what forgiveness is. So there's a difference in the penalty aspect, but the morality remains the same. See, that's the key. So if we take the scriptures as a whole and hold them up, we've got something to go by. If we don't, then who makes your standards? Where do you get them? Do you pick one out here and one out there because they suit you or they suit your friend? What ends up happening is when we self-rule, rather than choose the God rule approach, we end up falling under the rule of Satan, first of all. But what happens? Our emotions hide our ethics. Okay, because the feeling overrides the integrity. Our seeking of pleasure overpowers our following of principles. Sometimes to follow principles means the pleasures don't come to fruition. The fulfilling of our desires buries our focus on our discipline. Discipline must be in place first to be godly if we want God's blessing. Our feelings about things override our faith. And that's one of the key things is how we feel versus our faith. God does not base his overruling and providence in our lives based on how we feel. Our circumstances cause us to question our conviction. And that's the problem, Jonathan. It is, that's where you get into what we call situational ethics, when you have circumstances that override conviction. Because in the world today, the circumstances are different than they were back then. Now today you have a great awakening, as we started the program out talking about, this great awakening. And amongst the great awakening, you have the idea that, let me, let me back up a second, I don't know if homosexuality is something that people are born with or have a tendency toward. I don't know. And frankly, it doesn't matter because God does not judge who we are. He judges what we do, and thereby we are judged according to who we are. Okay, he judges our actions. Think about this, and we've given this example in other programs. Somebody, somebody who has a hot temper, okay, somebody who who can blow up and break windows and you know damage things and all that. What do you do with somebody like that? Do you say, well, that's their nature. Let's let them destroy the house, and when they're done, we'll just put the house back together because that's their nature. Or you do you teach them, you know what? That's what you feel like doing, but that's not acceptable behavior. If you're raising a child and that child has a – look, my son was a classic example. He's a passionate person. I can't imagine where he gets it from. And he was a handful to teach what was appropriate and inappropriate in terms of behavior. No, you can't do that. I know that's how you feel, but you can't do it because it's not acceptable behavior. If someone has that innate desire to be abusive, do you let them? Or do you say that's inappropriate behavior? If someone, you know, we're talking about a marriage between one man and one woman, and there are those that say, well, okay, between one man is, and one man is okay, and one woman and one woman is okay. Well, what about somebody who's bisexual? What do you do with them? Let's say that they're born that way. I don't know if they are, but let's say they are. Okay, what do you do with them? That's the issue that you come up with. You have all of these things that come up, and now you have to make up the rules as you go. Whereas if you go by God's way, the rules are set in place before you start. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. Let's read Romans 6, verses 17 through 19. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. I see that verse, I think, capsulizes what we're trying to say. Thanks be to God that you once had been slaves of sin, 
but you've become obedient from the heart and now are slaves of righteousness. He says, at one time you presented your members, your body, as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity. Isn't that where our world is heading? To greater and greater iniquity? And he says, but now you've been released from that. What this is saying is you can walk away from those things and walk towards something higher. Does that fulfill every one of your desires? No, it does not. Is being a Christian and following after godly principles supposed to fill all of your desires? Is sacrifice easy? No, and it's not. Jesus' human desires were unfulfilled. He gave them up so he could be our ransom price. There was a price that he paid gladly, willingly. That's what our call is. And that's what the standards that were given draw us towards, a standard that is higher. Read uh, Romans eight eleven to 13. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. All right. And then Colossians 3, 2 to 5, as we wrap up. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever you in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. And I think idolatry is the, is the key to this whole thing. Anything that takes God out of front and center is idolatry. And all of these things we're talking about this morning are built around the idea of taking God out of front and center. Folks, we hope you've enjoyed being with us this morning. It certainly hasn't been an easy road, but hopefully one to provoke your thinking along the lines of looking into the scriptures to find out what does God say about such things. And is marriage between one man and one woman? We believe unequivocally it is, and it should be honored as such. What about those who don't agree? We must love them anyway. For Jonathan and Rick, this is Christian Questions. We'll be back again next week, but until then, think about it.